this is an opportunity I didn't expect. So we we have the the gracious presence of Melissa Flores, who is the author of The Dead Lucky and a piece of Power Rangers lore here, which makes me really happy. Oh yeah. As the Power Rangers nerd and you as the one who kind of drug me back into the Massiverse after yeah. I introduced <laughs> you. <Yep>. All me. <laughs> Uh, it's great to have her on here, you know, um, as big fans of the massive verse right now. Uh, it's great to have one of the current writers for a new uh, massive verse, Dead Lucky, with us. So thank you for taking time to join our podcast today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're hey guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's yeah. super exciting to talk about this. You know, we've been reading all the stuff that's been in the massive verse right now with you know, Rogue Sun, Radiant Black, you know. It's, Which it's we been... still need to record Rogue Sun. <laughs> so it's been great. So um, why don't we, you know, just start off by, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about this industry, you know, give our viewers something to, you know, a little history lesson about everything, how you got to, you know, write for the massive verse and how you, and your time in, you know, yeah. talking to Kyle Higgins and Image and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, well, uh, if you don't know me, um, mostly known for my work with Power Rangers. I was with Power Rangers for about 10 years as a creative executive and producer. So my official title was director of Power Rangers development and production. Um, and I did that for Saban Brands and then for Hasbro. And uh, during that time, I, I wasn't a writer um, per se. I was more of a producer, but a lot of that means working creatively with the writers and with the licensees to tell the stories that they want to tell. And so we worked on the Boom comic books together, which Kyle pioneered there at Boom comic books. He had an amazing take. It did really well. I think it was um, honestly one of my favorite things that came out of my time working with Power Rangers. And through that time, Kyle and I eventually became friends. And he is... Uh, such a good guy and when i was no longer with hasbro uh we stayed friends and we we kept talking and he would tell me a lot about uh about radiant black i got to read some proofs i was really excited and to see it blossom the way he did and as it became bigger and bigger and became a thing and then we had ryan parrot do rogue sun and matt do inferno girl red and those amazing artists on that with them he basically asked me at lunch one day if I was interested in pitching him a superhero take. And I was like, of course, absolutely. Uh, because I had actually, I was done with being a creative executive at the time. I wanted to write for myself. That's kind of always been my first love. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd done a couple things for him already. And so, uh, after a couple lunches, I had a take that I really liked and I had a city, San Francisco. And so we put together that pitch. He helped me with it. He connected me with some really great artists. We've got together some really great designs, sent that pitch over to Image and uh, we got a book, which is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know this is an expansive universe and something that you've kind of helped craft this this take here with Dead Lucky and like with uh, the super massive one shot and the, the little tease at the end where we kind of got the introduction to it. Um, we, we found out like, cause I, I I'm going to be honest. I, everything that I've seen from that and like the powers of like Inferno Girl Red, it kind of opened up the possibility of like super like multidimensional, almost like um, I know it's a odd take, but like multiverse of madness style universe where like we can have all these alternate realities or different dimensions so i i gotta ask now having read the the proof that you gave me is this like an alternate future or is this like an alternate past that we're in or is this like the current like status quo universe like the u.s that we have this is this is this is it takes place in the same universe as radiant black and rogue sun it's just a different city so what the reason why san francisco looks so different and feels so different is that it has been privatized by a company called moro and so uh it definitely with the stuff you see on san francisco streets uh, which are it's very tech forward uh, maybe it would feel like this is five years in the future it's supposed to be happening now. It's all based on technology that exists now. Uh, it's not meant to be anything that we don't, uh, would not be possible today. The only difference is that Morrow has been given carte blanche essentially to run the city how they see fit. And through that, they have basically inputted these crazy tech forward 
things uh, like bots and holograms and all this stuff to create what they consider to be their perfect city of tomorrow. This is like a test city for uh, the way that they think a city should be run. So and it's like a, a Elon Musk on Rogue style universe. And exactly. Let's say if, if like Bezos and Musk <laughs> and all these uh, really Gates. people <laughs> racing to space were like, let's not go to space. Let's fix stuff here. <laughs> and so they were instead of putting all the money into space, they put it into a city. But uh, of course, when you have that kind of privatization over a city, mm -hmm. it has really good things, maybe, and really bad things, maybe. And Moro is one of those morally gray companies that maybe has a lot of fingers in a lot of different pots. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe what seems really good for san francisco isn't all that great for san francisco when you consider the other half of san francisco and how they're living oh um, <laughs> that's well, really exciting so um well as... both of us have at least worked or are currently working for amazon <laughs> yeah. so we kind of know exactly what that technology could do in the wrong no, hands uh, yeah, so... <laughs> exactly yeah i mean they said that google once had like a thing that said don't be evil on their headquarters <laughs> wall and then that recently like went away <laughs> yeah oh wow <laughs> it, it is terrifying like technology in the wrong mm -hmm. hands like that that's my degree actually is like information security so yeah i i know exactly like where that could go if it goes oh, rogue yeah yeah and san francisco is the perfect place for that because that is mm -hmm. you know silicon valley is so close that's where all these you know tech forward people are and live but it's also very old san francisco you have a lot of history there especially yeah. when you have you know chinatown and castro and all this culture yeah. so it's kind of a uh, and it's so interesting to me the way it's split up so distinctly in all these different districts that look so different to each other and so that was why i picked that specific city because of the old and the new and the rich and the poor and just the dichotomy that's taking place right now in that city is was really interesting to play with especially when you put bb in that world oh yeah so san francisco is actually a really massive city yeah. so uh, it was a good starting ground for, you know, uh, something technological, tech, techno advanced like that. So, um, so a question that I have, uh, and I think I speak for Vex and myself here, is that we are very into, like, uh, crossovers and multiverse situations. Now that we know that Dead Lucky is in the same universe as uh, Radiant Black and Rogue Sun, and after mm -hmm. reading the... Uh, the, the, the sample that you gave us uh i'm very curious to know um so because the one thing i like about uh the massiverse so far is that all of you guys have very different and unique writing styles that fit your story so well uh Ro the way rogue sun is handling its writing it's very different from how radiant black is handling its heroes and um i'm really curious to know like <clears throat> with how Radiant Black runs like his city with his powers and then how Rogue Sun is currently running his like could we see a sort of like different take on how your main character was going to sort of like run their city and run their rogue gallery when we eventually get like you know reincurring villains and maybe even other heroes in the city oh absolutely absolutely and I think the nice thing about it is that we're all we all have come from such different experiences uh ryan matt kyle cherish um everybody comes from a different experience and handles their story different ways and puts a little bit of themselves in each of their stories and so you get to see really cool takes and, and even the city itself informs the kind of story you're telling like chicago is very scrappy and it's you really see a lot of Kyle in Nathan and in Marshall in terms of like, you just saw the animated short film with real Wolf Riedel and it was just so much fun. And then you have Ryan who's just, his character work is just so good. So when you go to really rogue good. sun, you see this like, you know, very supernatural Gothic kind of medieval flair with me. I come from the corporate world. I was, I was a suit for a really long time. So I get really intrigued by politics and by, uh, basically threading the needle. And so with BB, when she's in San Francisco, you see her battling uh, not just Moro, but you see her battling this other group called the Salvation Gang, who hates what Moro is doing and is has went completely the other way until the point where they're essentially domestic terrorists. And 
she's kind of stuck in the middle. And so it becomes a navigation of who's right, who's wrong. What's the right way to handle this situation? Because BB herself doesn't really look at herself as a hero. She's fighting because she doesn't know what else to do that. Like that's the one thing she feels she's good at. So for her, she doesn't see it as her city. This is a city that's strange to her now. Cause even though she grew up here, it's, it's completely alien to her. So it's a lot of just, what am I doing? And she messes up a lot just because she's not out there to try and like take San Francisco under her wing. But that's kind of what starts to happen only because you have these two rival factions that are determined to carve it up and take ownership of it. And she's, she, she just spent a lot of time overseas fighting that very thing from happening. So to see it happening in her city is a very personal thing for her. Yeah. And especially like with, with like, especially the intro, because I'm going to respect your wishes from when you pitched this entire interview to Vermont. That intro has given me such a, because I came from a family that was like mostly like in law enforcement and, and I'm definitely the black sheep of that family. Um, mostly like law enforcement and military and seeing like the same struggles that like my uncles and my my grandfather and all of them came back when they came back from war and just struggling with like that that coming back into society and like not seeing yourself as a hero not seeing yourself as anything other than doing like your your duty as a, a number essentially and it's very much the same thing in the corporate world as well like having come back come out of amazon and just feeling like completely like i'm just number worker number seven thousand here i i don't matter I'm just doing my job. I'm doing everything here and having all of those like very real experiences from that line of life and having that PTSD and having all of the, this underlying guilt for like surviving something and watching like everything burn around you and seeing the, the dark side of war and then coming back and seeing it come out in your city just on a more like dystopian techno advanced, yeah. almost like, cyberpunkish especially with like the color palette that was chosen here yeah it yeah, feels but like, colors are incredible yeah very it, good art by yeah the way. It, good it's art. a very real and important message to have seen played out so perfectly yeah because it, it feels like you have come right out of bb has come like right out of that in real life and mm -hmm. that's a very strong writing style that i very much love and that like when I was talking like with our other co host that didn't chose to not join us today, I'm like, this is a story oh, that, he. <laughs> uh he he's Thanks. in like new relationship list. I'm like, and he's not much of a comic <laughs> fan. I'm like, all right, fair enough. You you, you go you go do you, man. Yeah, he, 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 <laughs> I'm he, kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> he's a manga guy, so you know. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Say no more. I completely understand. I'm like, this is a story that I'm very, very happy that's getting written, especially like now where we're seeing, sadly, like our own, our own country go through like a renaissance of going back to the dark ages. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, my, my entire Twitter timeline is a cesspool of like shitting on the government right yeah. now. <laughs> One thing I will say too is um, I already, uh, I love the writing with the main character because she has a uh, trait that I, uh, click with very much the uh talking to yourself thing and that's a big thing for me and um i'm really can't wait to when you know when the comic releases to see where that sort of like trait goes forward and how you're going to write that into her character more going forward because it seems like it's a very like a very important like mm -hmm. trait of hers and uh it, it clicks to me because as someone who uh growing up i was always someone who was talking to myself like i could, i was just talking to myself just randomly you know if i have like any issues or anything like that and then people would just be like what why are you talking to yourself and it's like i don't know and people know hey. tell me like hey you're talking to yourself like, yeah a, i know yeah so it's just like that like already like i'm loving the main character because she's already clicking with me on like that emotional level like i'm not saying i was i would join the military or anything like that I'm, like i'm not a veteran but you know it's just like certain small stuff like that really shows that i really appreciate comic writers like yourself who um integrate the small details of like things like that into their characters because it makes it really does make it, the reader feel like they can relate more to the character mm -hmm. if the character themselves has like traits no matter how minor they are you know it makes them seem more and the real. line like it helps sometimes like i i still talk to myself to this day and that's from like my own background i've talked about that enough on the channel to not kind of hash out old conversation but like that that like that line there is what got me is like it it does help because it almost lets you 
process your own thoughts, your own emotions, mm-hmm. and kind of have a plan there. And especially like somebody who's coming out of that in a, a guarded job like the military and having to know like exactly where the line is for like an NDA, what, where the line is for like what's still classified or what I can actually talk about even, mm-hmm. especially like events that would have happened in something like Afghanistan or Iraq that's still yeah. like very much under wraps it's a it's a very real like line of like what what am i allowed to say here to this person because mm-hmm. they're a civilian versus somebody that was from my platoon or somebody that was uh, you know in my just my bunkie or whatever Ver- and especially like talking to a therapist like i i know therapy for me has always been like a struggle it's something that i go back and forth to especially like in post covid mm-hmm. Um, that that line there, like you don't know what they're going to release now, especially in a, a techno advanced society, you know, as, or city like San Francisco. Like your data is still very much a commodity, and yeah. that could be like with stuff like BetterHelp in our world. Mm-hmm. You realize like that that data is bought and sold to the highest bidder, so she doesn't want to allow. I'm guessing like Moro or any of these other entities that we don't really want to you know talk about. There are stuff that would be in the future. To get a hold of that because that would be something that could be used against, used against her. her yeah i mean bb uh that was uh so just to clarify for for the readers because obviously they they haven't read the the proof yet um the first the first three pages are bb in therapy that's how you open the book and get to know her and she does have a personality quirk which i don't want to go too into just because it's it it ties to the ending but she um she definitely is trying to survive in her own way and one of and that the quirk of her talking to herself is something that I did very deliberately because I wanted the audience to get to know her and what's in her head. um, But I wanted to do it in a way that felt unique. And you're right. She's not going to talk to a therapist and she's not going to talk to her mom or dad or her friend, Eddie, because they just, it doesn't feel like they would understand. Mm -hmm. And um, for her, that's very much a survival tactic. And I really, uh, I really wanted to be authentic to that experience uh, because I'm not a soldier, but uh, my gr- my girlfriend is, and um, and I've had friends that are, and I've lost friends that are, and so I really wanted to respect that kind of perspective. But also, you know, soldiers aren't the only one with PTSD and survivor's guilt, so I really wanted to make that feel like people could understand where they're coming from even me even me like as much as I loved my job uh, it was a very high pressure environment and like I recognized after I left I'm like yeah there's definitely some PTSD yeah. <laughs> from the stress uh because I put so much of myself into who I who I am like so much of my self-identity comes into you know who am I if I'm not a creative or who if I'm not an executive and um so that's very much where BB is at the moment where she's like who am I if I'm not a soldier yeah okay. and a, a lot of her choosing to be this person choosing to be this soldier that you know fights with her robot is her falling back into what she knows and one thing i will fighting. say one thing i will say that i like so far about your writing style is it felt like the uh talking to yourself stuff um because i don't know if you know a writer by the name of rick reminder um oh, he, don't. He, I have to read him. he 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 wrote stuff like deadly class uh black science oh, you know what i have that trade i'm literally sitting that trade is in my to read pile yeah, so like, i'm excited he, like he's one of my favorite writers from image and um i will say like his his writing style of um of having characters like talk to him like talk to themselves like would do be a monologue your writing style of like bb talking to herself reminded me of that because you know how like some comics where like it'll be like the character sort of like narrating like their thoughts or something happening in the story. I found it was very interesting. I don't know if this was intentional or not, but I found it very interesting. Like the way BB was talking to herself was very reminiscent of that sort of like character narration, but she was talking out loud. So I, I thought that was sort of like a neat thing. Maybe if, if it was intentional or not, but I thought that was very neat writing style because like it definitely reminded me of like the Rick Reminder style like the main character monologuing their thoughts while you know this, the page of the issue is going through but BB's doing the same thing but she's doing it out loud so I thought that was very interesting and I really like that touch to it I appreciate it yeah I mean definitely I don't want to go too into it just because um I, you know it's it again like it ties into the ending so I want to keep yeah, it like a little exactly. mysterious for readers but definitely mm-hmm. it was absolutely intentional um i didn't want to do you know a batman nori kind of you know i am the knight right. <laughs> um I, I wanted her to feel like herself and um 
to your point, a lot of us talk to ourselves. I do it to myself mm -hmm. all the time. I just, if I'm, if I were, if I didn't have a dog here and a cat here to talk to all day, oh, I, I work from home and I would be talking, I'd talk to myself. So yeah. it is absolutely something that was meant to be intentional. It's all, it's also a way for the reader to feel like they're connected with BB um, in a way that she feels like she's talking to you mm -hmm. as opposed to her just narrating to some some rando right like yeah. this is something that was meant to feel i'm looking at you i'm talking to you and um which begs the question who who is she talking to really but right. um but that's what's that's what's fun about it and i hope people when they when they discover the quirk and and how it works I, i'm glad that people seem to be responding to it it's been a lot of fun and it was definitely a choice and it was one that me and kyle discussed and he really liked it and so i was i'm glad that other people are responding to it too it yeah. makes me happy so with everything that's setting up and like writing a black we're obviously like headed towards the, almost like a war and we saw like the super massive one shot we saw that like these characters could interact in the future and like rogue son is getting his rogues gallery with ryan's wonderful like gothic style like i i, I made the joke like the first villain in rogue son kind of reminded me of being like back home like really boondoxy <laughs> like the way the way the villain talked i'm like I feel like I'm back home here. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, yeah. Very good. Um, um, but, like, we, we obviously have, like, very, very different styles. And with you and all of the, the stuff in Dead Lucky that we saw in this, like, preview, I, I would love to know, like, how, if we would get, like, another crossover here, how they would interact. Because I that's the one thing that I really loved. And that's one thing that really tied me back into this, like, like the Dracon stuff really brought me back into Power Rangers, for example. Yeah. And then having talked to, because we both met like Kyle and Ryan at our uh, local Comic Con while they were pitching like Rogue Son in the Supermassive one shot. And I'm like, oh, I really need to get back into this because it all looks awesome. And, and like the, that all just got like announced like the day of our con. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, holy crap, like this is an interesting universe and everything. And we're just kind of diving into it. And then we saw your character. And Inferno Girl Red, and Inferno Girl Red, which had already kind of been like kickstarted and like the yeah. in the the first issue, and like with with the potential for this, and we we talked about this like when we did um, Rating of Black yesterday because mm -hmm. we were we were, we were very much behind on recording. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, with with a potential war, would we see like BB and uh, everything? tie into that or is that something that would happen very much down the line like another potential like poof into this uh one shot or another like maybe when another character gets announced is there anything that you could reveal for that or is that something you want to keep close to your vest here i mean what i will say is no sorry my cat is being a cat um <laughs> that's my mind i don't know if you heard uh, <laughs> or i don't know if you heard him he's been meow he's meowing at me um <laughs> What I will say is that um, each book is meant to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. We all live in the same universe, and there is uh, that's intentional, right? Uh, the possibility of a crossover is always is always there. Um, in but it is we intentionally are meant to stand on our own in terms of you know New Orleans, uh, San Francisco. And Chicago are all very different cities with their own very different problems. Mm -hmm. And me personally, for now, I'm just trying to focus on my book and get it as, make as strong uh, a first arc as possible mm -hmm. uh, to hopefully get more. Um, so I don't have plans right now to cross over with any of the other series. I think absolutely with Supermassive, that was amazing. And I think, you know, it being as much of a success as it was, again, with without saying I know anything, um, there's probably a possibility of that happening again. And if it does, I'd be really excited to try and be a part of that because I think, you know, BB's part of this world would be really fun. But I definitely think there is a... There is something nice about not having kind of a DC or Marvel kind of event where you have to buy Everything. 10 different issues. I'm to so understand. glad you said that. that. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. I mean, that's something I think we all want to avoid. 
Uh, yes. We don't want you have to be like, okay, you have to pick Rogue Sun 6 and, you know, Dead Lucky 3 and Radiant Black this. And like, you know, that's, it starts, I, I feel like fans might want to kill us if we do that. Already? So, already? That's like positive. Already right yeah. there? That's a huge I, that, positive. That's Why it's so hard for, because me, I'm still a newcomer when it comes to comics. Image is my favorite publisher because... You, you guys have written have so all many that great crap stuff going on. <laughs> like in, from, in, from Invincible, I haven't read Spawn yet. From Invincible, you know, to like stuff like Deadly Class, Black Science, uh, all all the great stuff that's been published by you guys. Like, it's very hard for normies like me to get into Marvel and DC because of all like, the, oh, well, you need to read this storyline into this, and then my friend is telling me, well, you have to start here and start here. Just, Do you start with, like, the Silver Age, the Golden yeah. Age? It's just a breath of fresh air to hear yeah. another comic book, art, yeah. comic book writer say, hey, no, all you have to do is read from issue one to here, and then, like, if we have, like, a spinoff or whatever, it won't, it, you won't be confused by the main, main line. So thank you so much for that. Oh, no, I mean, I read uh, Crisis, or I read Crisis Wars? Which one was it? That was, like, a few years ago. Um, Marvel's, it was it was it was either crisis or like the the war something wars and i was like i have no idea what's going on in this book i am so confused because like, i picked it up the a... spider-verse stuff now is just getting ridiculous and i'm a big spider-man yeah. fan uh so like that that kind of puts me a little bit at ease here because I, i've always said like image and boom have done like the manga narrative of just like and that's how this channel kind of started was like talking about manga and then i got hella burnt out on talking about like chapter 1500 of freaking <laughs> one piece <laughs> and all so i i'm kind of like i want to do more nerdy stuff and then this was the perfect like intro for our audience into like comics because like with the power ranger stuff and with like the mass universe it, it feels like that and also like with a lot of you guys it, it feels like you're falling into toku and a lot of our fans were already into that yeah so I, I'm like, this is perfect, and I'm so fucking glad <laughs> that we're not going into like the the full on crossover yeah. events and we're all that because that's been my biggest flaw. Like I used to be like super into like Marvel and DC and everything, and I, I figured like when Kyle set out having wrote like Nightwing and had to fall into that trap of like I got to make this tie into this issue and this issue and this issue. <laughs> He wanted to avoid that at all costs, launching a new line <laughs> with all the black market narrative stuff. And you guys are doing a very good job, by the way, with all the Supermass. I love the marketing and loving the uh, hype all of you guys are doing surrounding this. Because, as like I said, as a newcomer like me who, who loves American comics and always wanted to get into it, this is like a very good first step for newcomers. And I hope our audience who's watching this will definitely go out and check out, you know, Dead Lucky, Rogue Sun, Radiant Black, and Infra will go red when it officially drops because these are the perfect introductions into comics and i think what you guys are doing for the industry is really good and i like again i want to on behalf of you know the comic industry i want to say thank you to you guys and I, I really appreciate the hard work you guys are putting into this line because i really love the industry and i really love what you guys are doing with it and how much heart and soul you guys are clearly putting into this so just thank you for the hard work Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, this all wouldn't have been possible without Kyle and his passion um, and Michael Busutil, too, who also helps run Black Market Narrative. Like, they are both. Michael edits every single one of these books. Uh, Kyle consults on The Dead Lucky. He reads every issue. He gives notes on the art. He gives notes on covers. He So they're both very much involved. And it also helps, I think, that even though we all have our own individual properties, we all are all team players and everybody works together really well. Like it's it, it always helps when you like each other. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, I am very fortunate. Um, I'm the newest. I'm the new kid on the block. Um, and they're all so sweet and so welcoming. And I'm very fortunate that they're just a genuinely good group of creative amazing brilliant people and i'm just i'm just happy to be a part of it i'm just happy to be along for the ride but really i mean a lot of this is is kyle's brainchild and kyle just wondering what he can do using his experience and his honestly genius to do things that maybe you wouldn't expect like there was just a recent what he just did recently in radiant black if you're not following um is amazing if you scan a qr code you get something really freaking cool um, and he worked so hard on that and even super massive with that fold out, um, that you only get in the print edition is incredible. And now Ryan on Rogue Sun is doing a choose your own adventure and 
what they do with the medium really speaks to their experience and their vision. And I'm super grateful for Image and how they give creators the freedom to be able to do that kind of cool stuff. Oh, um, yeah. And that's the benefit of, of being with, with Image. You know, as much as I, I love DC, I'm like a huge DC fan. I read ton of DC comic books and, and same with Marvel. Um, but there is something to be said for the way image embraces creators and allows them to tell incredible stories that you wouldn't necessarily see other places. Yeah. Like even with like saga, like you had like a huge hiatus there and they're just like, welcome back. And yeah, they allow saga. them to, one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like nothing ever stopped. And that, that's something that's would never happen in a more corporatized imprint. Because they would have been like, well, we'll just get somebody else to write it, and you're done. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's something that's really very unique to, like, the image, and even some of Boom, like, with, like, the Power Rangers and the, uh, something killing the children uh, yeah. being giant successes. Yeah, uh, Boom Studios is killing it right now. Yeah. I, I, I've been hugely following... And my wallet is killing me <laughs> with like all the different covers and everything for like the Power Rangers line. And then trying to hunt yeah. down something killing the children is a nightmare here in Michigan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this like one of the are at least in my area here, it's impossible to find an issue until like the fourth or fifth print. <laughs> so I, that is such a, a pain. I ended up just trying to get it digitally and then comiXology has changed their whole how you can get it you gotta go on the Amazon oh i know website. oh it killed me because I, I i don't have the space to collect comic books mm. um when i was with power rangers i got comps upon comps upon comps and i just now i just don't have the space for anything anymore and so i used to live off of comicsology just because i liked just being able to pull it up on my ipad and when the switch happened with amazon it hurt my heart very bad <laughs> because yeah. I just was like, how does this work now? I'm so confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm going back and rereading uh, one of my favorite series, The Sandman, for the Netflix adaptation. And oh, gosh, yeah. I, I tried their new interface, and that's what spawned a video. I'm like, I, yeah, we had a we made a video <laughs> about all because... the changes. <laughs> just kind of like, I hate this because <laughs> makes it very hard. But the reason why I, I appreciate the comicology so much is like, uh, it was very good for newcomers like myself to. Uh, uh, be able to sort of like know where to start from because that's the biggest issue I've always had with getting into comics is um didn't know where to begin because Marvel and DC was so confusing with it but Comicsology made it easier to you know you know which volume goes in order you know what and it showed every tie-in yeah, and everything yeah. someone like someone like me I I'm currently reading uh I mean I'm reading a lot of stuff but one example is Monstrous uh I was reading uh the current run of Monstrous and I was so confused because like where you know where, I left off where I get. I go on Comicsology. Okay, I left off issue twelve. Issue twelve was in like volume three. Okay, I start mm -hmm. from volume three, and then I go from there. You know, it was very yeah. simple and easy to to mm -hmm. get start and read without having to worry about oh if I'm, I'm missing information. So so when the change happened, I was just like oh no. Well, now just yeah. just for people who haven't seen that video, like you have to go onto their website. You can do it for mobile, unless you log in incognito. <laughs> That's how I had to buy it. I had to be like, I feel dirty going into incognito. Uh, here we're we're going in, we're buying it, and I'm just like, this is a, everything that I had to do is just insane with that change. And now the the store layout doesn't show like tie-ins and everything like that, which makes for something like the bigger series and bigger tie-ins and crossovers and everything. It's really, really a pain. Yeah, and, I'll tell you my secret. I have two. Um, when I have to use Amazon Comicsology, I will. But the two alternatives that I do is one, I go to InStockTrades.com, and I'll get the hardcover trades, which are usually at least sixty percent off on InStock Trades. Um, so I just got the Gotham Central Omnibus, which I'm really excited to get through because I fell in love with that series. The other thing I do is I will wait until Humble, Humble Bundle, especially with indie comics, we'll do these incredible indie comic compilation things mm -hmm. where you can get an incredible amount of comic books from a specific publisher for like 20 bucks. So I recently, they did one for um, for Image, and let me look at what I, I it had for 20 bucks, um, 
Dead Girl, After Realm, Bitch Planet, Blue Monday, Glitter Bomb, I Hate Fairyland, Monstrous, Paper Girls, Rat Queens, Saga, and Wayward. I, I read both Every of those. Single <laughs> yeah. I read Every both single of those. volume. Every single volume. Yeah, it, it was a great Big deal. Pie. Yeah, and um, and they did the same thing for Power Rangers. They mm -hmm. had Mighty Morphin all the way through to Go Go Power Rangers, and so that's what I do. I tend to, oh, yeah. um, if I I will wait for the trades and then hope that there is a sale on Humble Bundle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Just download everything. And if not, then I usually will go to in stock trades if I can't wait. Wait for the trade, um, and get the trade uh, cheaper than you would normally do. And then otherwise, I'll just go to my comic book store and get the trade there because I'm trying to support them. But that's what I do uh, if if I can't deal with Amazon that day. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to t I'll have to take that your advice because I need to I'm, I need to I, I I only have a few comics that I'm uh, reading uh, weekly weekly. I'm always I'm going to add yours to the list as well once I appreciate that. Drops. So because uh, I'm really excited. So one question I did have, um, I really love the design. That, mm -hmm. that you thought up so i'm curious what is what was your inspiration for the characters design for your characters designs because i really love like the designs the color like the art is really fantastic your artist is amazing thank um, you so the the suit itself the suit design <coughs> excuse me the suit design was designed by an artist called uh federico sabatini who is absolutely fantastic. He uh, was on Marvel's Moon Knight recently. I don't know. I think he's doing other Marvel stuff as well. He's fantastic, utterly amazing. And all I told him was I, there were three things I wanted. I wanted a helmet. Uh, I wanted a Toku-inspired silhouette because we all come from Toku, and I wanted a Toku-inspired silhouette, especially because she spends a lot of time in her mech. And I wanted uh, a Calavera inspiration for the helmet, which the, the Day of the Dead Sugar Skull, because I wanted, it was something really important to me as the character. She's culturally half Chinese, half Mexican, and she's very much obsessed with death because nailed, all her friends... You nailed the nationality down to a T. <laughs> exactly. So I wanted something that felt, and, and I'm Mexican, I'm Mexican-American, and I wanted something that showcased my culture as well. And I wanted it in a cool way that if you saw it, it just looks like a cool costume. It's not displaying hey, Mexican artist, but it also pays homage to that culture, and it just looks freaking cool. And, oh, yeah, um, it looks really cool. And he wow. killed it. Yeah, he absolutely killed it. And then the colors, it was a lot of just working with what feels unique and different, what is going to work when you put it up against a Radiant Black, Infernal Girl Red, or a Rogue Sun, what is does not start with the letter R, <laughs> um, and what feels different. And so Kyle was very involved in that as well. And then the art in the book uh, is obviously by French, and he designed everything else. Uh, he designed the Moro agents, the bots, ghost, C BB civilian form, which hopefully we can show you soon because um, I know it's not out there yet. And, um, and yeah, he's fantastic. So uh, it's I've been very, very fortunate and very lucky that, one, the suit's so kick-ass, and know, two, it's... that the artist that I have that I'm working with is just fantastic, and, and our colorist as well, and our letterist. It's just an incredible team, and they just are so enthusiastic, and it, it's it's a dream like to work with all of them. They are yeah. just so good. Yeah, I mean, because I was just like, wow, like, because it's the super massive, like, all your guys' designs for each of your characters has just been really unique and different compared to other superheroes uh, that have been on the market now. And um, I loved Dead Lucky's design. First of all, that the name Dead Lucky, cool as hell. Sorry. Like, bro, <laughs> like, yeah. if, like, if that's her, like, actual, like, superhero name, I'm, which I'm pretty sure it is, like, bro, like, get ass. Like, if I had a character named Super, uh, I mean, sorry, said name Dead Lucky on my team, I'm like, bro, I'm not worried about anything. I don't care. <laughs> we, can, we can take on Thanos. We can take on Dark Side. I don't care. Okay, okay. Maybe not with. <laughs> let's not put Toku inspired feats against like intergalactic, you, you okay. know, planet killers. <laughs> gonna go on Twitter and be like, Dead Lucky can beat uh, Thanos. Let, <laughs> let's not. Let's yet. not. Let's not draw <laughs> out the power funny. scalers. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't know if she's that powerful. I will say maybe Radiant Black could beat 
could beat Thanos. I don't think she's quite there yet. Uh, even, I don't even I don't even know honestly if she could stand up to Radiant Black, given like how evolved he is in his powers and like she's you know it's her with her electricity and her mech. So she's got a ways to go. Maybe yeah. she'll get there. But um, but she yeah it's definitely it definitely helps the badassery when you have a cool name for sure. Oh uh, uh, yeah, and, and the suit and the design and everything. Um, I'm I'm really curious about her powers as well, but I probably don't want to. You probably don't want to elaborate on that just yet for the fans who haven't uh, read. Yeah, it. let's let's. I mean, what I will say for now is that obviously it's electrical inspired. She can see um, and manipulate energy currents and electrical currents, and that is how she's able to power Ghost um, and essentially bring him to life, quote unquote. Um, she doesn't see Ghost as a as a robot, she sees Ghost as a partner, which I think you get a little bit in, in issue one where she's talking to him and he's responding. Um, but she's used to working with the team and she doesn't have one. So Ghost is uh, Ghost is her patch, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And just the whole setting and the whole like just everything from what we what I've read looks like it's going to be amazing. I love the pacing of the writing as well. Um, it doesn't seem forced. Uh, you don't just like give off a lot of this information and then expect us to know. You know, you you take your time with it. You know, I it felt as I was reading. You know, I felt engaged. I felt like I understood page to page because sometimes a lot of these writers, well, good. Um, fall into this trap to where like they it's give the reader dump. yeah too much information and then uh cause that's one of the issues i have with certain comics that i read where um i still like it i still keep going but i'm definitely confused and i have to like go back and read because i'm confused about what's going on but uh, yeah. just just green already, lantern does fall into that trap as yeah. well especially like more recent yeah, monstrous does too a little bit uh, i'm starting to understand the story just a mm -hmm. little bit but uh i really like it for someone who you know <laughs> who's like I need to slow down to understand like the story and the characters. So 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 far already, a plus on everything so far. A plus. Oh, like, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, what I what I wanted to do when we first talked about how to, our way into the story, I didn't want to just start with a typical origin story. Um, I felt like if if I can get people on board with just okay, BB has powers, and just have them accept that, mm -hmm. and not have to explain yet why or how it happened then I could focus instead on the world that she lives in. And um, thankfully, it feels like that um, that works. Um, I think as long as uh, eventually we, we talk about how BB got the powers that people are on board with, like, okay, she has powers. Uh, okay, that's that kind of world. Let's see what happens with that. So, um, so I appreciate that. Yeah, we didn't want, I didn't want to bog it down with, with too much and thankfully you know it's not just me obviously working on these books uh, michael is an incredibly great editor and he definitely once in a while will put me in my place in terms of i want to do this is like but don't you think that's a bit much you know he's that guy and um and kyle also consults and so kyle is incredible about giving me his thoughts as well and so i take all that into consideration and, and i work with them on that and thankfully i think it came out like we still have ideas on on issue one and how we can make it clearer and make it more interesting and make it stronger so that you kind of really get that hit that hit of like this is a solid first issue i'm i'm in i'm ready to go so um so i'm lucky when it comes to that but thank you i appreciate that because definitely it's it's nerve-wracking to do an issue one and i didn't want to inf info dump dump or exposition everything so um that you guys are along for the ride with what we did it means it was successful so thank yeah, you i appreciate the, that the smaller scale is definitely appreciated because i think in stories like these especially superhero stories which can go for as long as like superman or batman has been around for um you you can take your time and i think a lot of the a lot of current writers uh think they have to rush into the nitty-gritty and um the one thing i always like is the status quo i think once you break the status quo is when um things and writing shifts and stuff like that can change and right now we're just starting our status quo because one of my favorite things about superhero comics is the rogue gallery like because the villains like superhero have to fight so i'm really hyped to see what dead lucky's rogue gallery is going to be when we get to it because um Right now, with the Massiverse, we don't have too big of much of a rogue gallery. I mean, Rogue Son has his, of course. But they're all defeated. Yeah, but they're all <laughs> defeated, right? And then Radiant Black is starting to get his. So, because um, every great story needs good villains, you know? I mean, Batman and Spider-Man have some of the most recognizable rogue galleries ever. You have Vulture, mm -hmm. you know, you got Green Goblin, Joker, stuff like that. Yeah. These are all recognizable villains that people love. 
you know so i can't wait professor pig yeah so i can't wait to be able to talk to my friends you know on twitter or facebook and be like yeah dead lucky rope gallery you know it's pretty good right right so i'm hyped about that uh, so with everything in the massiverse being like very much toku inspired it seems like you're leaning more into a bit of kyle's expertise here in an ultraman style um or maybe even a little bit more into a common writer style with like the way you're handling the universe and that's i would definitely say i come from power rangers i lived and breathed power rangers Mm -hmm. for 10 years um i love power rangers and so it may not seem that way um but when it comes to the toku aspects especially this is essentially a robot Mm -hmm. story you're going to see a lot of power rangers Hmm. uh in that respect in the spirit of things um is what i would say i love ultraman um actually ultraman common like it, for me it goes power rangers common writer and then ultraman just because i can never get on board with the oh this is gonna be very controversial and so i apologize in advance for everybody i don't like the ultraman suit it's weird to me. it's not aesthetically pleasing as it, much it's as really i want not. It. it's really it not doesn't change you know i mean one of the things i really love about power rangers is that their suits change every couple of years yeah and that's uh, especially like in and currently in like the the boom comics like you're getting to it seems like a, a zeo era and while Ryan's going to be leaving that in a couple issues, and you're seeing that change in the guard, just to play back into Thurman's uh, story, they're like, th- that's the part that makes or breaks it, uh, you know, with like the status quo, and especially like with the writer change and having something handled so massive, masterfully there, and then seeing that inspiration for the next story, and then everything going that way, and changing to a whole nother art style a whole nother story uh pacing and everything it it can really ruin that experience and controversially as well i think the disney era of power rangers was the ugliest (laughs) (laughs) you know i mean and again this is going to be super if we're going to talk about sentai uh this is going to be super controversial i haven't loved the suits that have come out recently i think the ones the the newest one the one with the animal with the one they're doing now i think those are really freaking cute where they're like all animal based thing mm-hmm. where they're like and it's very cgie kind of thing i think those are cute as hell um i loved the the q ranger suits the space suits yeah i didn't love the train suits uh i didn't love the animal ones the ones where it's just a big screen print of an animal on the front oh my goodness um, <laughs> I didn't love the cops and robbers suits, especially I like the robber suits, but not the cops. I like this. They look like band leaders. So I'm very opinionated when it comes to suits for yeah. sure. But um, you can tell that in the way you've kind of led, like, this is what I want to see in my story, kind of uh, storyboarding it for everybody to kind of draw it out and everything. It's I mean, if this is gonna be if this is gonna ha- if I'm gonna get to write it, then I you know I get a little more. It's fun to have a little more say it, for it, sure. But exactly. I definitely I'm not I don't do it in a vacuum. Um, you know, Kyle and the team really give their input, and I'm really grateful for that because I think the best writing comes from t- it comes from a team. It doesn't just come. You you know, every writer needs an editor, uh, because if you're doing it by yourself, you're kind of up your own butt. Yeah. Uh, you need somebody to to bring you back down to earth and say, "Hey, you know, maybe this isn't working the way you think it is." And, and a lot of like self published stuff really does fall into that trap because they they just want to do everything their own way and they don't see how that affects the story. Like every idea that you have is not a ten out of ten. It, it's very much like, and I agree. Like Lupin and uh, Pat Ranger, like I loved it. But it very much was like drawing on persona almost. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I liked the idea. I think the, the idea was cool. And I love that Sentai has that freedom to to be a little darker and a little more colorful, I think, than Power Rangers has been able to be uh, in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the closest we got to that kind of story was SPD. Very much but, so. But... Um, I mean, uh, Go Kiger was my favorite season uh, from Sentai. I freaking loved it, and I loved I loved the Shinkinger season. Um, some of that stuff you just can't tell that story. 
yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. That kind of story. I think Shinkinger. I just remember there was one episode they were sacrificing virgins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can't do that. I think we ended no. up sacrificing toys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we would find a way to dark. market the hell out of it too. <laughs> that's, but um, yeah, so they have they have they they take risks in really interesting ways, and and I applaud them for that. It, for me, it's more just you know sometimes aesthetically, I just don't like I don't like the styles. I don't like, but that's again subjective based on me. I know a lot of people mm. really love the different aspects and really want to see those adapted so uh, having yeah. dove into the power rangers and sentai subreddits people are very much want to see toker um adapted but it's not something that could be marketed and that's yeah. something how that do you do that with that zord though like with that <laughs> mega zord you can't you, you, you there, there's no way that they can make it into a toy and that is like the the yeah, tier that's one the, that's the marketing if the tier oh, one for that and and I say this hoping that my toy colleagues who I worked with and love very much never hear this. I just it was ugly <laughs> and it was weird and like I just I mean I think trains and it made sense for Japan. That's the thing. That's you have to think about what works for Japan versus what works for the US. And for yeah. Japan, it toy trains are a huge part of Japan. Everybody takes trains everywhere. It mm -hmm. is absolutely a part of way of life. Here in LA and here in the US, it less so. Yeah. yeah much every less so. Every culture is different, so uh, every just creator... like we would never see Lupin versus Patra yeah, adapted here in the culture current political climate. Has different yeah. like, sort of things that uh, you know their communities like. So what's popular in Japan won't necessarily be popular here, and you know we've seen that because you know I'm not much of a Sentai guy myself. You know, I'm me growing up, I was more of a TMT guy. That's why I read the Power Rangers cross TMT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's comic. right. I love that. Uh, seeing seeing you should just watch in space. Into... You should just watch in space. <laughs> Oh my Turtles god, yes. Well, you know, what? it was yeah. so funny. I um when I I had lunch with Brian like 3 years ago or something at Comic-Con and I had asked him because at the time I was still with Power Rangers, I asked him what is your dream project and he said Turtles and Rangers. He, it, oh. I mean, it, it became a thing, and and it yeah. became a, and literally when we found out it was a thing, I'm like, Ryan is gonna die. We need to get Ryan on this, and um, and thankfully that was already what they had in mind, and he's fantastic. I mean, I don't yeah, think he I gets don't... enough credit for the work that he has done for Power Rangers. Um, that storyline I, 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 I love so much. That storyline. Yeah, was... I mean, Kyle is fantastic, and he's a freaking genius. And I don't think Sh I think Shattered Grid just proved it was masterful. Um. It was amazing, but um, it is not an easy job to follow that up and I and and hold your own. And I think Ryan uh, absolutely killed his run and everything else he's doing for Rangers. He is incredible, and um, and Turtles was just so much fun. You know, you got to have Turtle Rangers and and That's Green so Ranger cool. Shredder, and it just was <laughs> a fangasm of fun. So cool. and, as a Turtles fan, I was just like. Like, any, seeing anything Shredder turtles, as a ranger yeah, was turtles, so amazing. You, you more, more than like, well, even like, just his way in. His way in was incredible because I think he's so he's so, he's so good with character. And who else is going to remember that Tommy was a freaking orphan, basically, <laughs> and use that as a way to get into the story? Yeah. To have him join the Foot Clan because one of his foster brothers is in trouble. I mean, what an incredible detail to take and turn into this huge, amazing thing. Yeah, it's absolutely masterful to have gotten something so unique out of that. Uh, but the the biggest thing that, as we kind of wrap this up, because I know Thurman's got other things going on, and you probably have a million other things that you need to do right now. Yeah, I, got, I got a right issue for him. I'm, I'm late. <laughs> okay. I, I, I want to say, like, having drawn so much inspiration from your time in Power Rangers and everything there, I... I I'm just going to ask a question as a huge fan of that as well. If you were given a chance to take the reins of the boom run while also working on dead lucky, is that something that you would throw your hat into because we have such a, a unique opportunity and it kind of feels like we've come home in the, the, the massive verse with like all of the, the people that have kind of had their hands in that universe. And you're seeing like that inspiration go to an extreme that you can never see in something that was originally like that intellectual property, but their own. Would you want uh -huh. to ever dive into that and write your own story in that universe? I mean, I'm going to be honest. That'd be absolutely terrifying. Um, with I having worked so closely on those books with people like 
Kyle Higgins and Marguerite Bennett and uh, Ryan Parrott and now, you know, Matt's incredible books. It's, it would be very intimidating for me to try and follow that up. Um, I love Power Rangers. I will always love Power Rangers. I think if ever I were given that opportunity, I mean, how could I ever say no? But that being said, there's a lot of incredible people that love Power Rangers. And um, I think whoever, I trust the, those editors because uh, I, I know them so well. And I know how, like Daphna Pleban, who is I, incredible and whatever, whoever, the, whoever she works with on those books, she's going to lead them well and they're going to do an amazing job. And um, I'm just excited for what, whatever comes next for them because I, I have a different perspective of those books because I, I was on them and loved them for so long that I know they're in good hands. Yeah. If that makes sense. So, so um, it's such an intimidating thing to having been so close to it. That's why I was curious with your history. Like, I, I, I kind of assumed, but I'm just like, I gotta know. Gotta ask. As a fan, yeah. you have to ask. Right. <laughs> you know, Doesn't hurt to right. ask questions. Like, this how this whole interview just happened. I, I was, I wasn't able to sleep. I'm like, well, what the heck? I'll throw my hat in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I've had to. Um, it, like, I have a shattered grid tattoo. Like that's how much I love the books, and I've had to. Uh, the you know, when I left Power Rangers, um, it was kind of a necessary. It was almost like breaking up with uh, with a boyfriend or girlfriend that you've had for a really long time. Like mm -hmm. it hurt for a little while to not be a part of it, and and so I kind of had to take a little bit of a break mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. fandom in general and from what everybody was doing uh not because i had any ill will or any issues but it's just one of those things where i'm just like man this kind of hurts sometimes like it's like yeah. you love what they're doing so much but also you want them to do it but also like you're not a part of it anymore and that hurts a little bit yeah and um and so what i love now is I, i'm in a place where i can really enjoy I, I finally went back and re and read the last two years of Power Rangers mm -hmm. that I had missed. Um, and I was just so impressed yeah. with the twists and the turns and the stuff that Ryan has done. I mean, that guy was running two books a month and with the amount of lore he was doing, it was incredible. And he was doing these crossovers and he was doing, you know, all these one shots. The workload that man had was insane. <laughs> insane. And then, you know, Matt has done some incredible stuff on Mighty Morphin. And so I, it was nice. It was, it was humbling in a really great way because nothing just fell apart when I left, you know, they took it and made it better. Um, but that's a good thing, right? It, sh it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that no one person is Power Rangers. Mm -hmm. And no one person is responsible for one fandom. There's always going to be people that are going to step up and, and take care of it if they love it. Yeah, take yeah. the mantle, which is always good. Exactly. Always good, to, always good to have multiple talents have their take on certain characters. And yeah. stuff. And I know that's a lot when it comes to comics. A lot of people don't like that. But, yeah. I mean, if someone has a has a story they want to tell when it comes to like characters who've been around for so long. Mm -hmm. I mean, let them shoot their shot. You know, I, I know, uh, uh, Frank Miller's versions of Batman are, you know, people are like hit or miss on them. But I mean, if, you know, it's, it's for some people and it's for, not for yeah. other people, you know, and it's mostly like, it comes down to the team that he had during those eras too. Cause mm -hmm. you had a more restrictive DC and then you had a more open DC and then you had a very, very tight, tightly closed DC for a long time because we're like, can we survive? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, if someone has a story, I say just let them write it. You know, no, yeah. no harm done to let someone take up a Oh, you'll always have somebody pissed. Yeah. And so, that, you can't please the, everybody, yeah. but as long as you're having fun and enjoying your writing, then I say yeah. more power to and, you. Know? And, like, especially now in such a polarized, especially like in America where Power Rangers is like the, the giant portion. I, I still dabble in it, and I see, like, people mad that, like, the Death Ranger is uh, potentially non-binary, and I'm like, you know what? It, it's cool, not... why Yeah. Why wouldn't he be, though? I mean, that's the thing. For me, it's an alien. Like, right. if you really think about it, aliens have no... Like, a wire... who are we to assume that aliens have any concept of what our 
version of patriarchy and gender is. Mm -hmm. uh, They're uh, aliens. Uh, exactly. We know nothing about them. So why would they have the same rules as to what is male and what is female as we are? Yeah. I, so I thought that was genius. <laughs> I thought, I, I mean, I, I, it was a great way to include an indie into a franchise that has very, very historically not been super inclusive. Like we're just now getting like lesbian characters in like the the main show, and we're getting like potentially more open in the comics, and yeah. we're having so much like more. We're definitely going forward, forward in and the and nerd them, but we're you also have forward. the 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 loud minority in the yeah, background. Like we, we don't talk about them. don't they're don't not, yeah. don't they're put not the real fans. Into our, yeah, I'm like, I mean, just to complain. yeah. My my perspective has always been and always will be if Power Rangers is meant to be the the champ everybody if if the mantra of everybody can be a ranger is true mm -hmm. then everybody should be a ranger exactly. and it was incredible you know in the 90s when you saw these superheroes that you had you know an african-american and an asian-american and you know tommy's uh brother turned out to be native american you had rocky who was hispanic all these different people and and you could see at the time you didn't see those superheroes of color anywhere else and so it was interesting and dynamic and we've you know for me it was incredibly important when we were doing it uh when i was with the franchise that we kept up that sort of inclusivity but you also now being diverse and being inclusive maybe it's not enough anymore just to be racially diverse mm -hmm. if you're going to stay true to this idea of everybody is a ranger and um that's actually something i'm incredibly proud of and i'm very grateful to boom studios for pushing and championing so interesting and to the hasbro publishing team for championing it too you know elaria ari from beyond the grid by margaret bennett was the first lgbt ranger that was yep. out and proud and you know we were able to do the first kiss uh same-sex kiss with ari in a one shot and change doesn't happen quickly with these big corporations and but i definitely like think biggest, yeah a credit to a credit to Boom Studios, a credit to Hasbro, because I think that opened the door. And I'm not saying it's responsible either way, because I honestly have no clue. I'm I have I know nothing. I am not a part of the brand anymore. I have no more inside information than anybody else. But being able to have an LGBT Ranger in Dino Fury, it was important that the books did it first mm -hmm. to prove that the sky wasn't gonna fall. That people want this sort of thing. And yeah, you're always gonna get people that are mad about everything yeah. you know people are mad about my existence i'm female i'm gay i'm hispanic yeah. there's a lot of things people don't yeah. like about me yeah. but i'm still an american i still love fandom i'm still gonna do what i do i'm just trying to be me and i think yeah. that's what a lot of people real uh, have to understand you're trying all these people who identify as non-binary and gay or asexual or you know anything of what they're just that is not all they are Exactly. It informs who they are. But at the end of the day, they are people. Yep. And people, you know, we're not, I, even in Dead Lucky, De, uh, BB's pansexual, we're not, I'm not trying to be, she's not trying to be the trophy pansexual for every pansexual that ever existed. She's just trying to be BB. Yeah. And, and, I, and go ahead. Sorry. Myself, uh, you're fine. As an African American myself, I definitely agree with what you're saying because um, we're just trying to live our lives. I'm, I, I'm very simple. All I want to do is just work, pay my bills, and enjoy my hobbies. That's all I want. Yeah. So uh, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. And, and, and as yeah. a non-binary, uh, I'm just so glad that we're getting to the point now. Like you said, like I'm glad the comics did it first because if it was just the show, it would have been like – it's just the diversity uh, in this. It's just diversity hire. It's just diversity kiss. It's, you know, whatever. But having the comics do it first, it was more like, this is what the fans wanted. And then you have your drama tubers who are just going to run with it and just yeah. spin it their own way. Those and, who would not be named. <laughs> yeah, I, th they are very much banned from our comments because I pissed them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, but I, I'm so glad that you have helped in, in some regard bring a little bit of light into that because that's the point i was making like and with dead lucky being pansexual which is another you know aspect of my life i i i don't try to just be the token pan non-binary person i i, I want to just live my life and right now in america it's very fucking terrifying to exist 
as a queer person in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And just, I know I have the privilege of being white, but it's also, you know, it's not something that I, I take for granted and seeing things that I've loved for so long, having gone from like the dark ages of like the early Savannah years to now and then like with Dead Lucky and just being open and just telling a natural story instead of just like shoehorning it in like a bigger publisher would do to be like look at me i i'm part of disney and uh, i i want this here and uh, oh i'm gonna cut this scene from the movie mm-hmm. so it can sell yeah. in china yeah, or it can I mean, uh, thankfully that doesn't seem to jive anymore i think representation absolutely matters and i think in bb bb lives in san francisco and so i want that to reflect san and, francisco so i mean you are gonna see non-binary people you're going to see gay people you're going to see trans people we're not going to announce that that's what they are Mm -hmm. um because again they're not you know sitting there announcing that that's what they are they just exist in that world and then maybe through the course of conversation or in the course of something small you're going to be like oh that character is that way you know but it's meant to just be they're living in their world just living their lives just like any one of us but the fact that they are there that's what's important that they have a seat at the table um because i think that's really important and and i say this as being you know an executive who has many a time been the only uh cishet she her female latina or minority in a room full of cishet males (laughs) caucasians like i have seen how that representation matters and it's something incredibly important to me and that's something that i will always fight for in in anything i do um when you play the licensing game it's different yeah. always because you're not just playing by your rules you're playing by the brand's rules and so they have reasons for doing the things they do and you can push only so much mm-hmm. um but thankfully dead lucky is mine and uh i i can push to my heart's content <laughs> yep. perfect so as we wrap up here vex any last questions or you know uh, thoughts I'm very glad that we got that last little bit of conversation in because that is something that is very important to mm-hmm. have. I agree. I definitely here. Agree. And, and like the last thing that I want to say is thank you very much for this opportunity. It, it's been a honor actually having mm-hmm. a chance to interview somebody so important to a new brand, to something that is very much a foundation of this channel now. Yeah. And I am super grateful. It was that nice you... talking to you as well. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to read your story when it comes out. I will be posting it everywhere on my social media. Don't you worry. I appreciate it, guys. I'll... Yeah, F- yeah. FOC is July 11th. Mm-hmm. So uh, get your orders in before July 11th. Um, every little bit helps. The The more we sell before FOC, the better it is for the book and the longer I get to I get to write it. So, Perfect. I will definitely um, be pre-ordering for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm doing after I get done with this and making yeah. a thumbnail. Because <laughs> this is definitely going up tomorrow now because to YouTube is... I have to go online it because yeah. comicology, being comicology. Yeah, uh, YouTube is being YouTube. I've been stuck at processing for another video for three and a half hours now. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> so yeah. thank well, you very much. Well, I appreciate much. that. No, I appreciate the opportunity, guys. It was so nice to get to know you and talk to you. And um, thank you guys for giving me the platform if, to talk about my book. If you ever want to pop back in, hit us up, and yes. we will be happy to give you a platform here. Yes, and thank I you appreciate very much. It. Can't wait to see you at a future convention so I can get my autograph. Cause yeah, yeah I'll, be at, uh, I'll be at Comic-Con, and I will be at C2E2, provided I don't get COVID at Comic-Con. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw Anime Expo, and that looks like the most ridiculous I, super spreader event ever. I'm like, I'm so glad I did not get tickets <laughs> i'm terrified i'm absolutely terrified but i also i have to go um and i want to go i'm really excited to go especially i want to go to c2e2 because my book will come out on the third and then c2e2 is on the fifth so um I, that'd be the first opportunity i have to really get to talk to people that have actually have it in their hands but yeah i am i'm, I'm like i'm trying to like how can i get another booster shot before i go i i, I have, have to go get my second here. booster after i heal up from surgery so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I feel you. Yeah. Oh, so well, until next time, everybody, you know, peace good, out here. You have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. Have fun at the convention. Stay safe. Can't wait to read it. Thanks, guys.